Thanks very much for coming to this talk. We are going to be looking at uh, hacking and forensicating an Oracle database server. Although I just gave this talk at uh, Black Hat and I had an hour and a half to do it, I've just found out I've got 50 minutes, so I've had to like slice some of the talk. So I think the boring forensic side can go and the hacking side is the fun part, especially for this audience. So we'll, we'll concentrate on that. Uh, so who am I? If you're wondering who I am, uh, I'm a vulnerability researcher. Uh, I started out in buffer overflow exploitation. Uh, the last bit of work I, I did that I'm really proud of was back in 2003. Uh, that was defeating the stack-based protection built into Windows 2003 server. Uh, I then started moving into database uh, uh, security. If uh, anyone remembers uh, the SQL Slammer worm, I was partly responsible uh, for that, unfortunately. Um, and uh, when Oracle turned around and said their products were unbreakable, I, I laughed a little bit and did some research and uh, proved it wasn't unbreakable by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so I, I've been concentrating on the C&E uh, side of things, or had been up until about 2007, 2008, uh, and started looking to the forensic side because obviously it was so trivial to break into database servers and continues to this day to be trivial to break into database servers, <coughs> read Oracle. Um, the, the whole idea of, well, if someone is breaking in, uh, how do we find out what they did when they got there and what uh, we can do uh, to uh, you know, work out uh, what we can do to prevent them from doing the, the same thing. So that led on to the forensic side. Uh, I recently, well, recently, a couple of years ago, I sold my company, so I get to do free stuff now. Uh, I have no commercial presses, which is great, so everything uh, presented here is all the white papers are free, all the, the tools, which I probably won't have time for, but you can go to the Verity website and download them. Uh, they're all free. There's, there's no commercial uh, version of it or anything like that. So, yeah. If you want to uh, follow my research, I can be found on uh, D. Litchfield on Twitter uh, or email me at david at uh, verity.com uh, with a three for an E. So uh, database breaches are common. That's much as a given these days. You, I don't think I need to convince many people here that uh, databases are where the, the goodies are at. Uh, I recently did a survey on the Oracle L mailing list, which is like for DBAs and programmers and stuff like that. It's uh, a fairly... Uh, good list, and uh, I asked uh, who is doing uh, checks on their logs, you know, like security logs and so on, and only one third of DBAs are actually checking their stuff, and most of those are using grep, and I find that astonishing, because let's face it, grep's not going to work on, you know, uh, binary-based, uh, you know, bespoke uh, custom file formats uh, that most databases uh, have. Uh, forensic seems to be this, or database forensics specifically seems to be this no man's land where the uh, incident response people are saying, well, you know, I understand the IR stuff really well, uh, like uh, analyzing hard drives and so on, but databases, well, that's this whole other extra stuff I need to learn, and right now I'm working with too many other cases. And the database guys are like, whoa, I know all about how to like, uh, improve the speed of a database and, and so on. But when it comes to IR stuff, yeah, that's, that's way over my head. I'll, I'll stick to the stuff I know. So there seems to be this no man's land where no one seems to be doing any work. And uh, as a consequence, it, it's lag behind, it lags behind uh, on the forensics front. So getting to the good stuff. Uh, compromising the database. Um, so in a typical database compromise, there are several stages. First off, there's gaining access, obviously. Uh, once they've managed to gain access, they obviously then need to elevate privileges if they want to have full control over that database server. Once they've got the privileges, the requisite privileges, privileges to do whatever they want, they might want to modify data. They might want to exfiltrate data. There's a whole number of things that they want to do. And thereafter, they might want to use that database server as a staging platform to attack the rest of the network. Uh, you know, so that might include uh, breaking out of the database to run operating system commands uh, and then download their toolkits and so on. So we'll look at each of these sections individually. Okay, so um, I've been playing with Oracle for 10 years, uh, give, or, give or take a year or so. And uh, yeah, it all started when uh, Larry Ellison announced at his uh, conference that Oracle was unbreakable. And you know, that, you say that to a hacker, and that's like a, a red bull to a, uh, a red bull to a flag, a, a red flag to a bull. And uh, I, I was drinking red bull earlier, and I think that's why I'm speaking so fast as well. And I've got red bull on the brain, not red flags. So um, yeah, the uh, my brother and I did quite a bit of research, and uh, Mark found my brother Mark found a, a really interesting flaw, 
And this is, a, remember, an EAL 4 plus uh, certified products under the common criteria. And Mark found a flaw, basically, where if you entered a, an overly long username, there was a stack-based buffer overflow, which was trivial to exploit. Uh, so a, a product which, under the common criteria, is supposedly secure, you know, uh, could, could, in the authentication mechanism alone, be trivially compromised. And of course, that wasn't the only flaw. There, there's, uh, there were a number of issues. Uh, buffer overflows in the TNS listener. I'll explain in a minute what, in fact, let's explain what the TNS listener is. OK. So you have the Oracle database server. The first port of call a client connects to is the TNS listener. The TNS listener is responsible for communication on the Oracle database server. It's, this is really disconcerting, by the way. I can't see anyone's faces, you know, so always I can see these bright lights. So, but anyway, the, um, the, the TNS listener is responsible for communication. Uh, so when a, a client connects to the TNS listener, it hands off the connection to the Oracle database process, and communication takes place thereafter. Now, uh, the TNS listener itself has had uh, a, a number of buffer overflows it, uh, in it in the past. So again, uh, without a user ID and password, a, a, an attacker can exploit these to trivially gain control. But a much more interesting attack, one that doesn't require exploitation of buffer overflows, was a thing known as external procedures exploitation, XPROC. So I'll, I'll go into to that very, very quickly. So let's say you're using the database normally, and you want to execute PLSQL code. PLSQL code is like the, the way you extend the Oracle database server and can like execute stuff that basically allows business logic to take place and, and so on. Now let's say PLSQL, which is you know, a fairly substantial language, doesn't do what you require it to do. What you can do is write a we see program, a we see library, and uh, hook that into the database server by using external procedures. Now what happens is, uh, once we you know, uh, compile our library, we then tell the database server about it by doing a create library statement. And we wrap that library within a, a procedure, basically, which then calls the, the function within that library. Now, what happens is uh, the Oracle process connects back to the TNS listener and says, will you load this library, execute this function, and pass it these parameters? And the TNS listener goes, well, you know, I won't do it for you, but I, I'll tell you what, I know a program that will. And it launches this program called XPROC and tells the Oracle process to connect to XPROC. And XPROC, sorry, um, the, the Oracle database uh, process then says to XPROC, load this library, execute this function, and pass it these parameters. And XPROC goes in and does that for it. Now, normally this happens over named pipes. But um, it turns out that uh, you can use uh, TCP as well, which is great, because me on the other side of the internet can connect to a TNS listener, providing, of course, the firewall allows access, and there are unfirewalled Oracle servers out there, and say to the, to the TNS listener, I'm the Oracle process, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, will you load this library for me? And the TNS listener sends back me a message over uh, TCP and says, no, but if you connect to this port, uh, XPROC will do it for you. So I then connect to uh, that TCP port that XPROC is now listening on. And then I say to XPROC, hey, do me a favor, will you? Load this library, execute this function, and pass it these parameters. And XPROC goes, yeah, no worries. And there you go. Without a user ID and password, we can load any library we want, execute any function, and pass it any parameters. So of course, we could use uh, load MSV CRT.dll. The, the Microsoft Visual C runtime and execute the system function. Or if it's a Unix system, we could call libc and do exactly the same thing. So we now are running code as the user account that Oracle runs under. So on Windows, that's going to be local system. Or uh, Linux, it's going to be the Oracle user. Either way, as far as the database is concerned, you are God. So Oracle fixed that. Uh, and it's a really funny, uh, yeah, it, it is actually funny. Uh, fix whereby they said, okay, what we're going to do now is limit where you can lo load libraries from. And uh, any attempt to, to load a library outside of the, the, the uh, designated place uh, will we'll log that, just so you know there's some forensics uh, uh, information there. And they did that uh, by uh, using Sprintf to, uh, to, to pass the library name into a stack based buffer. And anyone who programs in C here, and, and with a fixed size uh, buffer on the stack without any length 
checking done, uh, you immediately know, well, Sprint F is going to lead to a stack-based buffer overflow vulnerability. So even though they limited the library that, where the library could be loaded from, all I needed to do to, to regain control without user ID and password was exploit this new buffer overflow in the logging process. So Oracle, we were informed about that, and they, they fixed it by putting a length check before calling Sprint F. Why they didn't call SN Print F, I don't know, but they decided to remain with the Sprint F. Now, it turns out that any environment variable names within the library name are expanded, but that's expanded after the length check now. So if I go dollar path, and let's face it, a path is maybe 200, 500 characters or something like that, suddenly we get to exploit this buffer overflow again just by going dollar path, dollar path, dollar path. We, we find the sweet spot because, let's, to be honest, the path might be different on one system against another system. But when we find that sweet spot where you know, the communication is just reset because you know, the, 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 the XPROC dies, we can then move backwards byte by byte by byte, overwrite the save return address. And we have an expression in the UK, Bob's your uncle. I don't know if you've got it over here. Uh, Bob's your uncle. You own the processor again. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the thing is, even to this day, if you are local to an Oracle database server, in other words, let's say you've got SSH access, uh, if you're local, you can still do this trick locally to get code to run as someone else. So 10 years after the fact, we can still do this stuff. Oh, and incidentally, of course, um, if UTL TCP is available, once we're connected to the database server, uh, as a, a low privileged user, we can use UTL TCP to create the right packets. And because we're now suddenly local, so from the Oracle process, we are communicating directly with the listener and, and XPROC. So again, we can still affect this kind of attack. And today, uh, Oracle is still vulnerable to this kind of thing. Now, one would think that dropping msvcrt.dll in the directory where Oracle allows you to load libraries from is a bad idea, right? Well, guess what's in there? You know, it should be in the Windows System 32 directory, but for some reason they thought, well, we don't want it in there as well. We, sorry, we, uh, we need it in the Oracle Home directory, in the bin directory. It's like, so they, they make all these fixes to prevent you from calling the system function in msvcrt.dll, but they go ahead and then dump the DLL in the same directory. So it's all for naught. So I, I really don't understand what kind of security questions are being asked at, at that organization. Like, we're about to do this. Is it a, a good idea? Uh, if not, let's not do it and find another solution. Uh, that's the minimum kind of uh, security question that should be going on. And it, it's clearly not going on as far as I'm concerned. So anyway, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can use to, to gain access uh, without a user ID and password. Uh, and of course, Oracle is uh, one of these great database servers that has depending upon the applications you install, a number of default accounts with default user IDs and passwords installed. Now, this has changed, obviously, in, in, in 10G. You now have to set a username and password, uh, sorry, the password for the key accounts, sys, sysman, dbnsmp, and, uh, sorry, sys, sysman, system, dbnsmp during the install process. Uh, whilst you're installing, though, the default passwords are in place. So sys has a passwords of, of, of change on install by default. But during the installation of the Oracle server, the password is still change on install. So if you can find someone installing Oracle at that particular moment, uh, you can obviously still connect as, as sys with the password of uh, uh, change on install and uh, do your nefarious stuff whilst the, the server is being installed. Obviously, you have to hit the, the, the moment right. It, to be fair, it's probably never going to happen in the, in the real world. It's just one of those uh, things you, you, you observe in the background. But there's a whole bunch of accounts out there that are typically locked, but still have a default password in place. And uh, the, you'll find in the wild there are instances of servers out there with a you know, DB and SMP still with its DB and SMP password. CTXSYS still has its password of CTXSYS. In fact, there are about six to 700 accounts, depending upon what products have been installed with default usernames and passwords. So even if you um, can't exploit any buffer overflows, trying a username with its uh, the username as its password is a good guess. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there's a, a whole uh, number of weak passwords and uh, account compromises available. And if we have access to the file system, what you'll find is that the passwords are often logged. They're encrypted, but they can be decrypted because we know what the keys are. Uh, the, the, on the file system, there are certain log files where we can snuff the passwords out. So again, if, oh, and they're world readable, of course, as well. 
And so, uh, yeah, even if we don't have a user ID and password and we have local access to the box, we can still gain access uh, by snuffing these passwords. And of course, if we're dealing with a web-based application, then we can just piggyback, uh, if, if it's vulnerable to uh, SQL injection, we can just piggyback the whole you know, account authorization process, is, um, sorry, authentication process is handed, handled for us by the application. So we just pig, piggyback our, our SQL injection off the back of it. OK, so uh, assuming we get access, uh, let's, I'm just going to create an account. Uh, create. Uh, user uh, uh, defcon identified by uh, password. Oh, great, quit. Uh, grant. So I'm going to give this uh, defcon user a uh, grant create session, rather, to DEF CON. Uh, the only privilege required to connect to the database server is create session. Uh, I'm then going to connect as this guy. I create uh, DEF CON with a password. OK, so this is the account we're going to use uh, to, to run our nefarious stuff. Select like star from session privs. We'll see that's all he's got. OK, create session. So basically, this uh, user, the only uh, privilege he's been granted directly is the create session privilege. So he can connect to the database server, and he can't do anything himself from here on in. But there's a special user account called public, which uh, means everyone on the database server, essentially. So whatever public can do, DEF CON user can do as well. Now, uh, I spoke about PL SQL earlier on uh, when I was referencing external procedures. The default um, security mechanism for executing uh, PLSQL objects, such as procedures, packages, and functions, and so on, uh, is the definer's privileges are used to execute um, the, the object. So uh, if the sys user creates a, uh, a PLSQL package, he is the definer. Any vulnerabilities in that, as the definer, will execute with sys privileges. That's the default. You can uh, also specify, using uh, the auth ID keyword, the current user's privileges should be used. But by default, it's the definer's privileges. So any package which is, is owned by a highly privileged user and is vulnerable to PL SQL injection can be abused by an attacker to gain full control. Well, not full control. It, it depends on who owns the package. But in the case of sys, sys has all the privileges that's required. So uh, yeah, if, if sys owns a, uh, a vulnerable package, then uh, an attacker with only create session privileges can uh, exploit this flaw to gain full control of the database server. Now, Oracle has probably had about three to 400 such issues found in sysowned packages. So we're not just talking about a, a one and two case scenario kind of thing. This is the Achilles flaw in the Oracle database server and continues to be. So every three months, Oracle releases a critical patch update. Sometimes they fix five critical flaws, sometimes 20 to 30 critical flaws. More often than not, there are at least one or two, if not more, PL SQL injection vulnerabilities in Oracle. So I'm going to show you a, a fake one because I, I don't want to put, you know, um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm just going to show you one that uh, I made. Uh, so uh, if, if you want real ones, look at the critical patch update from uh, last time. Or if you want uh, a brand spanking new one, wait for the next one to uh, critical patch uh, update to come out. They're, they're to a penny, these kind of flaws. Uh, so we uh, would, as an attacker, let's say, remember, we only have the create se session privileges. If we wanted to do uh, things uh, like delete the audit trail, we obviously need the privileges to do that. We can use these SQL injection flaws in high-privileged uh, uh, packages to do things like that. Or we might alternatively just say, grant ourselves DBA. Now, that would be a very noisy thing to do, obviously, in a real-world attack. And you probably want, wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so what you, you might find is um, people inserting directly into the sysauth table, which essentially 
does the same thing as the DDL uh, statement for uh, grant DBA, but uh, it uses an insert instead to, to grant those privileges. And, and even then, you probably, you, all of this kind of stuff is making noise and uh, in, uh, probably won't be uh, done. But for the sake of argument, it, it's a nice demonstration here, so let's do it. So there was a nice little um, attack previously, or a way of facilitating attack, where we could generate our own cursor that we would pass our nefarious SQL on, and uh, we would inject uh, the dbms underscore sql dot execute function into the vulnerable procedure, uh, and that would go ahead and execute with the higher privileges. So whatever SQL we pass, for, be it grant DBA, would execute with the higher privileges. But Oracle went ahead and fixed that. So what we need now is another way of looking for ways of running arbitrary SQL. Uh, with SQL, Microsoft SQL Server, you can batch SQL uh, statements. So you can just like do a select, then an insert, then a, a grant and a create, whatever you want, one after the other in, in any kind of SQL injection situation. With Oracle, you can't batch statements. So if we wanted to say something like grant DBA uh, to, to public, and it's in the middle of a, a, a select statement, that's you know, where the vulnerable, actually, let's talk about that quickly. Here's the sample that we're going to use. Can everyone see that at the back? Is the, the font big enough? Yeah, it should be. So all we're doing is the, the, the procedure owned by Sys, in this case, I've called it vulnproc, and it takes the user input str and concatenates it into this query select object name from all objects where owner equals user input, and then executes that query. Now, this here is an example of PL SQL injection, but because it's a select statement, we're injecting into a select statement, we would be limited to, without an additional hack, we'd be limited to doing a, uh, another select statement, like a union select or something like that. But that's, that doesn't get us DBA privileges, so what we need to do is you know, work out another way of doing that. So we have our... Um, our auxiliary inject function, in this case, it's the new context function on the dbms underscore xml query package. Now, what this does is basically takes um, an SQL query, such as select star from dual, and executes that. But it doesn't have to be a, uh, a select statement. It could be uh, a, a grant DBA statement, which we'll show you in a second once that's finished. Uh, I've just freshly started the, the Oracle database server, so things are needing to load into memory. Right, great, that's it done. And that will return very well. So now we're going to use this um, to exploit the floor. And let me put this in front of that. So before doing that, let's show you it's vulnerable to SQL injection. So we're going to execute it through... That's how you would execute it normally. So um, what would happen is foo would be placed into str, and the query would execute. If I put a single quote in there, we see SQL command not properly uh, ended. So that's indicative of a SQL injection flaw. Go minus minus, and you know that minus minus basically chops off the rest of the statement. And uh, yep, so we're all good there. So now we can go ahead and exploit that to gain. Did you? Sorry, I thought someone said something behind my back. Or was it a ghost or something? Uh, lost my train of thought. Right. Uh, if I do set role DBA, first off, you'll see we've not been given the DBA role. Uh, DBA role hasn't been granted or does not exist. So now we're going to gain DBA privileges. So what we've done there is injected. This is our little trick, by the way. Remember I said... Uh, we can't do, if we're in a, a select statement, we can't do anything other than a, a union select or whatever, or a subselect. Well, this declare pragma autonomous transaction basically tells the PL SQL compiler, uh, this query is fine to execute on its own, it's its own transaction, you know, go ahead, everything will be safe. And now, we, as a consequence, we can, uh, you know, execute arbitrary PL SQL, and in this case, it's begin, execute immediate, grant DBA to public, uh, and we end that, and we get the you know the message it's successfully completed. So if we go set role DBA now, DBA role has been set, uh, and if we do select star from session privileges, honestly, it's so easy to break into Oracle. You don't need to applaud me on that, you know. <laughs> select star from session, but thank you, it is appreciated. I'm here all week. Try the steak. 
So we've now got uh, all these session privileges. Uh, so we, we've gone from create session only through to exploiting a PL SQL injection floor, which there are three to 400 of, uh, depending upon the, the version of Oracle that you're looking at. Uh, and suddenly we are, uh, we're God as far as this database is concerned. So now I'm going to do uh, alter user sys identified by password. So I'm now changing the password for the sys user. Uh, and as you'll see uh, in a minute, uh, logging in as sys is going to give us at, uh, some fun stuff. Connect sys slash password at ORCL as sysdba. OK, so we're now connected as the sys user. Uh, we're going to start playing with a thing called Aura Debug, which is a nice little facility uh, that allows us to read from the Oracle process memory, write to the Oracle process memory, and also execute arbitrary functions and so on. So let's, before we do that, yeah, breaking out of the database. How are we doing for time? We're doing OK, great. Breaking out of the database, running arbitrary code. Well, obviously, uh, if there are a buffer overflows, and again, maybe uh, each uh, CPU, one buffer overflow, sometimes there's zero buffer overflows being fixed. But I, I actually, I think there's at least one in every, one or more being fixed in every uh, critical patch update. Uh, sometimes there's lots. Uh, some, yeah, sometimes they get a slew of uh, flaws coming in. But we're specifically going to look at the Aura Debug stuff here. Now, what Aura Debug does is basically, as I said, it allows us to peek and poke at memory. Uh, Aura Debug. Aura Debug has been documented uh, before, by the way, so this is nothing new. Uh, people have been speaking about using Aura Debug as a hacking facility for a long, long time. Uh, so, yeah, this isn't like OD I'm dropping by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so, if I go Aura Debug help. So here's the help options. Uh, some of them are very interesting. Uh, some of them are not so interesting. Uh, but we're going to be looking at these two, peek and poke, and uh, call, which basically takes a function name, and uh, you can call that function. So here's one I made earlier. OK, so first off, we need to set the, um, the process ID we want to debug. And we're just going to use the process ID of my given process. So uh, set my PID. So one of the great things about Aura Debug, well, let me rephrase that. It's bad that we can do this with Aura Debug. But one of the good things thereafter is any time you use uh, Aura Debug, a, a trace file is created, CD. DRR, actually, find str forward slash i forward slash c or a debug. Uh, OK. I just want to find the, the current slash od. Um, do, do, do. Uh, 6, 20, 28. OK, so this is our current one type. So we can see, remember the first Aura Debug command I issued was help. Uh, that's written to this trace file. Uh, and then I did set my PID and so on. That's written to the trace file. So any time you use Aura Debug, it's being written to a trace file, which is great when it comes to uh, forensics. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to run an operating system command. Because remember, on Windows, Oracle runs as the local system user. So any arbitrary code I execute is going to execute with the privileges of the, the local system user. And in this case, I'm going to create a user account called AuraHack with a password of uh, PWD and add it. So, and I'm going to call the system function. So what I'm going to do first is write to this memory address, four bytes, which is uh, n e t space. So that's the the net space of the net user add command. And then, so all this here is basically net user add uh, pwd slash sorry net user or a hack pwd slash add. And I'm going to write that into memory. And you, and you can see here the uh, I increment the 
the address obviously by four, because if I didn't do that, obviously we just overwrite the, the same bit of memory. So what you'll see here, let's uh, clear the screen. So, oh, don't do that to me, right? Give me two secs. Uh, because I restarted the system, the, the memory's gone, so I'm just going to fudge one. Uh, We can do this, by the way, again, using um, Aura Debug. We can do, dump a stack trace, and then using UTL file, we can read that in. But I'm just going to cheat, uh, because that takes a wee bit longer, 4372. Uh, VA dump minus P4372. OK, pick one at random. OK, uh, we don't need execute read write. We just need read write. OK, reserve. That, that will do. Right. 1E23. Edit, bind, replace. 1DDF. Uh, Bling. Replace all. OK. Home and Control C. Right, let's try this again. OK, great. So uh, what we've done there is written the, the net space part. Uh, so let's add the rest of it. So I now have written in memory the net user aura hack pwd slash add. That's the operating system command I want to execute. Now. Uh, I basically call the system function here and pass to it the address at which can be found the operating system command, the net user add stuff. So before I do that, if I go net user, whoops, net user, we can see I've got VMware user administrator David and guest. There's no Aura Hack account right now. But I'm going to get Oracle to now create the user by calling the system function. Function returns zero, as it should do. So net user now shows us we've got this Aura Hack account in there. So thank you. So what we've done is from a lowly create session uh, privileged user account, jump privileges to uh, DBA, change the sys password, and now we're connected to sys. We can then start poking and uh, peeking into memory. Uh, and running arbitrary functions. Now, of course, doing, uh, we're only limited by our imagination in terms of uh, what we want to do as far as uh, executing arbitrary code is concerned. We could use this to uh, sh shell back a shell, uh, or send us uh, back a, a reverse shell or anything we want. Uh, we just obviously need to create the right structures in memory, get the right addresses, and, and send them uh, to, to the function, basically. So. And uh, one of the great things, of course, is when you call uh, a function, the value, the return value, uh, whatever EAX uh, is returned in EAX, is basically dumped in here. So if we like call the socket function, we can get the socket handle by looking at the, whatever the, the function returns and so on in there. OK, and then we can then add that in and, and so on. So, but I think the, the key takeaway from there is uh, every time you use our debug, it's in that trace file. So what we can do is look in that trace file. Uh, you can see the stuff I've written to memory, I can now extract. And then as a forensic investigator, I can go ahead and start working out what the attacker attempted to do. So if they indeed try to spawn a reverse shell or something like that, their code is going to be in memory, uh, not in memory, in this trace file. So we can build up a very good picture. So anything they're doing is, is, is in there. But you do have to remember, of course, that we're connected to sys. We, as far as that database is concerned, we are God. So if we wanted to, we could delete that trace file. Uh, suffice it to say, though, if they don't delete the trace file, it's a wonderful source of information. Right. And of course, we can run operating system commands in, in other ways. Uh, we uh, spoke about uh, external procedures earlier. Uh, let's do that. First off, I'm going to do one that will fail. 
Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because I want to show you uh, another useful bit of information. Remember I said it was logged. Uh, the, the name of the library is logged. Uh, that's actually run Procmon in the back. Okay. Right, now, because I've just specified msvcrt.dl, I haven't specified a path or anything like that, it will look through the system path for the, you know, the right DLL and decide that it's not in the right location, it's not in the Oracle home, so we'll get a message being logged saying that it's uh, an invalid DLL path. So remember I said you have to wrap it, this bit of code at the bottom wraps the, the, the call, so let's create that. And remember that this is going to fail when I execute the function. So, uh, and we'll get the invalid DLR path. But if we look here, uh, where did it create it? And mm -mm -mm. it bind. HS. There we go. Jump two. Okay, we can see in there uh, someone tried to load msvcrt.dll uh, and it was sys and the library name was this and everything like that. So again, useful forensics information. Uh, worth looking at that directory. But let's make it work now. Remember I said um, they dropped msvcrt.dll in the, the bin directory in, in Oracle Home. So we can now go ahead and recreate that. If I do net user, uh, we've got the Oracle hack, or hack user. We're now going to create or hack to the password. So we get that success with completely, su su completed successfully. Uh, and that user, we've now got the rhack2 user in there and so on. So dropping msvcrt.dll in there wasn't a smart idea. But to be fair, if you think about it, watch this, uh, cd backslash app, cd. db home, cd bin. OK, this is the Oracle home directory. That's all attack surface. You know, these, these are in there by default. Uh, any function on there, we can obviously call, you know, and if they're, you know, susceptible to, th to things like overflow or whatever, then we can still use this external library thing. What Oracle should do is have a, an area where there are no DLLs by default. There are no code objects by default. And if you want to add your own stuff, you can put it in there. Uh, having it as the Oracle home is, is too lax as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, all of this is attack surface, basically, from, external, uh, from an external procedure point of view. So, yeah, that should be tightened up considerably. We don't have time. Okay. Right. Okay. So... I've, I've really uh, run through um, the, the, the hacking side of things. So we've got a, a couple more minutes left uh, for a wee bit of the forensic side. So the database has been breached, and what do we do now? Where is the evidence? With Oracle, the evidence is everywhere. It's great. There's so much redundancy built into the Oracle database server. It's wonderful. Uh, security, not so wonderful. Uh, if we look at Microsoft SQL Server, SQL Server 2005, I think, has had three critical patches required since 2005. So what? That's pushing six years, and it's had three uh, critical patches. Oracle, uh, Microsoft SQL Server 2008, I think, has had zero. If we uh, look at Oracle, you know, each, every three months, patches are coming out time and time again. As I said, sometimes they're patching up to 30, uh, 20 to 30 issues. Sometimes it's only five or six. But every three months, you have to worry about, or well, you have to worry about Oracle security all the time. But every three months, it's, it's patch day. But SQL Server's pretty crap when it comes to, you know, logging stuff, 
that's useful to uh, an investigator. Obviously, you've got the transaction log and you've got the error log file. But as far as that's con as, as far as uh, you know, useful information goes, that's pretty much it. Oracle is is great. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, so let's look at some of these uh, locations. So obviously, the the system metadata itself, the the information that makes up the database server, is a wonderful source of information. Uh, the data files. Uh, when a, uh, a record is updated or deleted, the data is left intact. It's just, well, each row of data has a three byte header. How are we doing? Okay, good. Each row of data has a three byte header. The first byte of that uh, three byte header has uh, its flags, basically. And the, the fifth bit, if you flip that bit, it says it's deleted. If you flip it again, it says it's not deleted. Okay? So we can very, very quickly find uh, deleted data by looking at that first bit of the, 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 the three-byte header to say, is the bit set or unset, and whether it's deleted or not. So if you delete data, if you think, I'm hiding you know, uh, my tracks, I've deleted all my stuff and everything like that, it's still in there. It's just that bit's been flipped. Or if you update data, that bit is flipped and everything, and a new row is, whoop, a new row is created. So uh, it's, it's really useful in that information. Uh, it's really useful when it comes to that information. There's a thing called the active session history. Uh, I wrote a couple of papers on this uh, a few years ago. So what active session history is, when uh, the, the Oracle server's running, it, there's a, a, a sub-process running in the background, basically pulling the database server every three seconds to find out what's going on at that particular time. It takes a snapshot. These snapshots are recorded in memory. And then every half hour or so, one in 10 of the snapshots are recorded in, in, uh, on disk, basically. So if you have a query that lasts for, say, three seconds, you're going to have a snapshot in it, definitely in memory somewhere. If the query lasts for more than 30 seconds, chances are there's going to be a snapshot written to the disk. So this active session history becomes a really useful source of information for looking at select attacks. Select attacks, obviously, are just uh, you know, getting access to data. So if you're downloading a customer database that, say, has uh, 5 million records, that's going to take longer than 30 seconds, probably. If you're using something like UTL HTTP or UTL Inadra to exfiltrate uh, data over an out-of-band method across the network, that's going to take a long time. And so there will be calls to, uh, to uh, th these SQL statements will be logged in the active session history. And as a forensic investigator, we can go back and look for evidence of even select attacks. The transaction logs, you know, like the redo logs in Oracle, anything that requires a transaction is logged in the redo log. So that's another great source of information. So that's things like deletes, inserts, updates, uh, select for updates, any DDL like grant, uh, uh, grant creates and uh, drops and so on. All that information can be found in the transaction logs. Undo segments, uh, if, you, if you make a change, an undo segment is created that has information pertaining to that change. So again, we can query that. Uh, the memory itself, in a live response situation, we can start querying certain key tables for uh, 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 key uh, virtual views, rather, for information. So one of them is VDAR SQL. It has about three to 5,000 queries that have the most recent ones that have been executed. So if we can find an attack in progress or an attack which happened just a, like half an hour ago on a fairly quiet database server, there might be evidence of attacks in there. VDAR DB object cache is another great source of information. So again, a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper on uh, hacking uh, the, the Java virtual machine uh, built into Oracle. And uh, looking through the source code of the, the default Java objects, there's this UTL wrapper that basically takes user input and, and passes it to uh, you know, the, the system function, basically. So if th there is no reference to this UTL wrapper, anywhere else in the Oracle code, and I think it's left over there from development days, so no, uh, no real-world code should be using it. So if it's in, if it exists in this DB object cache, one can infer from that that an attack has probably taken place. So again, there's the, these uh, virtual tables, uh, which are a wonderful source of information. And obviously, the, the log files themselves, like the TNS listener log file, is the first port of call. Uh, any kind of connection, is, is going to be logged in there. Caveat emptor, though, when it comes to the TNS listener log files. When a, um, a client connects, 
they pass the program name and stuff like that, and that's all logged in the TNS listener. But because it's under the control of the client, they could say whatever they wanted. They could pretend to be a JDBC client, whereas in actual fact, they're a C hacking tool. Uh, so don't fully trust the information in there. Uh, use it for like pattern recognition and, and so on, perhaps. But, uh, or, or another one, for example, when uh, you authenticate to Oracle, you, what happens is you connect to the TNS listener. The TNS listener, okay, great. The TNS listener uh, then passes you off to the Oracle process, and you authenticate or attempt to authenticate. And if authentication uh, fails, the client tears down the connection and you just start the whole process again, connect to the listener, the listener passes you off to Oracle and so on. Uh, now, as a, as a consequence of the client being the one responsible for tearing down that session, if we don't choose to, if we fail authentication and we don't choose to tear down that session, we can continue to authenticate once we've got that uh, connection to the Oracle process. So we can make one connection to the TNS listener which passes off to the Oracle server, we then say to the Oracle server, is the password for sys this? And if the Oracle server says, no, no, uh, don't, no that's not the password, we don't tear down the connection. We just say to it, well, how's this for a password for sys? And we keep on firing uh, multiple uh, attempts down the, the, the same TCP pipe. So we're not having to go through that whole setting up the communication again. So what would take typically uh, a minute to go through a couple of hundred passwords, we can go through a couple of hundred passwords in a second, so we speed up uh, brute forcing. Obviously, later versions of Oracle, uh, account locking is enabled by default, so we would just go for the syscount because you can't lock out that uh, account anyway. And obviously, the trace files. We looked at our debug earlier. I'm not going to have uh, time to show you any of the tools and stuff. If you are interested in the tools, it's, it's, they're free. Go to the Verity website download them, play with them, have fun, and everything like that. Uh, so thanks for listening. Are there any questions before I disappear? I can barely see you, so if you do have a question, shout out. OK, no questions then? Great. Thank you very, very much for coming.